Nine and one run with complimentary plays after cashing in last night with the Atlanta Hawks and a free play coming up on a very difficult game, I feel. Game number six of the San Antonio Memphis series coming up in just a moment. Of course, the NFL draft coming up in a couple of hours. Quick story for you. The first draft I ever covered, I was actually in college at the time. It was back in 1982. Got to go down to Veterans Stadium uh, to cover the Eagles uh, draft that day. Totally different back in those days. ESPN, it was only three years old. Mel Kuyper Jr. was not the big draft guru that he is today. Uh, Chris Berman was not anchoring the draft coverage. I think it was Bob Lay back in those days. Paul Zimmerman was their featured draft analyst. And it was a different time. You know, there was no internet. There was no cell phones. Hell, I go down, and because at that time, you know, you had to be there from the minute the draft opened because, God forbid, if you were the reporter and, let's say, the Eagles swung a draft day deal and you weren't there to report it, well, that was bad news. And the Eagles were picking 20th that day, so you were there from the opening bell until almost four and a half hours later until the Eagles' pick came up. And you talk about boredom. You talk about tedious And I was there with, I believe, the four beat writers for the various papers at the time in Philadelphia. There was the Inquirer, the Daily News. I think it was the Philadelphia Journal and the Evening Bulletin at the time. And I'll never forget about an hour into the coverage, there was a TV in the corner. We were in the dining room of the Eagles uh, at Veterans Stadium. And somebody said, do you think they get ESPN on this TV? And I'm thinking to myself, hey, guys, you know, we can go 20 minutes to my mom and dad's house. We've had cable for years there. Finally, somebody from Veteran Stadium staff comes in and gets ESPN on this little 13-inch TV up on the corner mount in this dining room so we can watch the draft. And I mean, it was a boring, boring draft. Uh, Kenneth Sims was the number one draft pick that year out of Texas for the New England Patriots. To give you an idea, that was the draft where Arch Schleister was the number four pick taken by the Colts. We know how that turned out, didn't we? Uh, Jim McMahon goes to the Chicago Bears with the number five pick. I mean, of the top 10 picks, the best pick was Marcus Allen. How he lasted that long going to the LA Raiders uh, was number 10. But the Eagles were drafting number 20, okay? And, I mean, you're talking about absolute boredom. Now, I knew, even though I was in college, probably as much as any of these beat writers knew about the draft, because in college, I went to Temple University, I had my own uh, sports talk show. I had a co-host as well, and we had the only sports talk show, and we had a very powerful station at Temple that was heard not only in Philadelphia and the tri-state area, New Jersey and Delaware, but because of cable, it was how, uh, actually broadcast on a cable channel throughout the state of Pennsylvania, all the way to the western part of Pennsylvania. So we had a, quite a big listening audience. So the week before, even though there were no national radio networks like ESPN or anything like that, hey, I was using that job to try to get a real job putting together audition tapes. So I thought, let us do our own mock draft before mock drafts were really a thing that everybody does nowadays, all these years later. So, you know, I had already done all my research. I knew all these players. I did my own mock draft. I had contacted beat writers in all the different cities, got sound bites of who they would draft for their respective teams, spliced it all together. And we did this big featured show. So, you know, most times, you know, and I had covered probably at this point, maybe 30 76ers games, probably about 20 Flyers games, you know, in the preceding year. But this was different. This was the Eagles. This was the team I grew up following. This is the first time that I had really been exposed to anything with the Eagles. The team that my dad and I sat there every single Sunday and watched their games. We scheduled our Sundays around them. We used to have season tickets some years, you know. We used to go to a couple of games every single year. This is the Eagles. This is totally different. So to be able to hang with the beat writers and talk knowingly about all these players coming off the draft board, that was pretty cool. In between running the 7-Eleven and carpools, getting food and drinks because the Eagles, they weren't supplying anything, sitting there waiting for somebody to come out. It was almost like waiting for the Vatican to announce, you know, the new pope and seeing the white smoke coming out of the Vatican because you just sat there waiting for something to happen for somebody to come out of the Eagles war room to announce something. So here's the deal. After four and a half hours, again, the Eagles have the 20th pick and everybody knows the Eagles are like lusting after this wide receiver at a Clemson University by the name of Perry Tuttle. 
it was no big secret that the Eagles probably wanted him as one of their featured targets that day. Problem is, the Eagles coach at the time, Dick Vermeil, happened to mention to one of his coaching friends, Chuck Knox of the Buffalo Bills, a couple days prior, it came out after the draft, that the Eagles were targeting Perry Tuttle. Well, the Bills, if memory serves me correctly, pull off a draft day deal with the Denver Broncos. They jump up to the 19th spot and they go ahead and they grab Perry Tuttle. So the Eagles are then on the clock. And they go ahead and they draft a wide receiver out of North Carolina State by the name of Mike Quick. So I'm there. And now, of course, finally, the TV people show up. And I am no more than maybe eight feet away from the podium when Dick Vermeil comes out to announce the pick. OK, and they announce that they're taking Mike Quick. Dick Vermeil was a guy who he wore his heart on his sleeve. There was no holding back his emotions, his state of mind or whatever. I'm telling you, I'm looking at Dick Vermeule's face and it looked like somebody took away his puppy on Christmas morning. You could clearly see this ash white face, the disappointment in his face as he was trying to speak glowingly about Mike Quick. And you could clearly see the disappointment that the Eagles thought that right there in their grasp, they had Perry Tuttle and boom, the Bills go and snatch him away. The moral of the story is this. Perry Tuttle in three teams and four injury plague seasons had 25 career receptions. I think Mike Quick had like 353 catches, made four pro ball teams, and in six pretty good injury-free seasons during his Eagles career, he was a number one go-to guy. You just never know what you get on draft day. But we'll all sit here and we'll speculate and we'll watch here tonight and you never know what's going to happen. Okay, NBA free pick. Let's get to it. Now, of course, last night we had a uh, split in terms of the um, favorites and the underdogs. So right now going into tonight's action, you have the favorites with a slim lead, 19 covers versus 18 for the underdogs with a push along the way. And nine of those puppies have won outright. I think it's a very difficult game here tonight because San Antonio, I was kind of surprised that you're looking at the Spurs laying five and five and a half points in this contest just because they won game number five rather handily at home. Suddenly they're a big favorite here on the road, considering that the home team has absolutely dominated winning these games, regular season and postseason combined, winning nine straight games in the series straight up. Spurs winning 116 to 103 at home on Tuesday. Uh, you know, there's been no answer for the Grizzlies when it comes to stopping Quali Leonard. Uh, you know, 28 points again here in game number five. Um, the good news for the Spurs in game number five, Patty Mills, a career playoff high, 20 points. Tony Parker, two games removed from being shut out, fouled with 22 points in game number four, 16 points in game number five. Spurs 14 for 18 on three-pointers. They shot 53%. And Manu Ginobili, who had gone over in the series, no points, had 10 points, three assists, and three steals as he found a little bit of the Fountain of Youth in 18 minutes off the bench. The bad news is that LaMarcus Aldridge once again struggled uh, offensively, 12 points and nine rebounds. He has really been a non-factor in this series. He only had 29 points total in the two games in Memphis that the Grizzlies lost, and then only 12 more points here in game number five. So 41 points total in the past three games. The other thing that I think is... Uh, a little red flag in terms of the Spurs is that even though they won game number five, they allowed the Grizzlies to hit 52 percent. Uh, Marcus Gasol had 17 points. So if you're looking at Memphis's box score, you say, OK, that wasn't bad. But then you look a little further and you see that he only had one rebound in 10 fourth quarter minutes because he really struggled going up against David Lee. Uh, he had nine rebounds in the two games that Memphis won. Nine rebounds in each of those two games that they won in Memphis. But he averaged only five rebounds in the three games that the Spurs have lost. Zach Randolph has really struggled in the past two games, eight for 22. You know, he sat out the fourth quarter in game number five, and he struggled offensively. Now, Mike Conley has lit it up. Uh, the Spurs have had no answer for Conley defensively. He struggled in game number one, and in the past four games, though, he's averaged 27.3 points and 7.5 assists. I think the key to the Spurs' victory, however, in game number four was the, the uh, fact that they dominated the boards and they outscored Memphis 20-10 to 10 in the paint. 
And that's really surprising when you consider that Memphis should have done much better down low with Gasol and with Randolph. So we go back to this point spread at five, five and a half points. It is a big number. And you go, isn't it kind of strange? San Antonio just lost games three and four at Memphis. And the home team has won nine straight in the series straight up. And yet the road team is five, five and a half point favorite. So your first guess would be, oh, geez, I got to go ahead and I got to take the home team in this game. Gee, if we were to apply that type of logic, Milwaukee would have won game number four at home against Toronto. The Wizards would have covered last night against Atlanta. Right? Wrong. I just think San Antonio closes this game out here tonight. Listen, on paper, the Spurs are by far the more talented team. Um, Game three, they played a lousy game, okay? Game number four, they didn't play that good of a game. If not for Leonard scoring 114 straight points in the fourth quarter, they never would have reached overtime. But they are still the better team. And I just think that they don't want to go seven games. They don't want to have to go back to San Antonio. They want to finally put away a playoff nemesis, that being the Memphis Grizzlies. And they don't want to be extended any further because there are bigger fish to fry waiting for them in the form of Houston, in the form of Golden State. They don't want to be extended any further. I cannot believe that LaMarcus Aldridge isn't sooner or later going to go off and give Leonard some offensive support. So I'm going to go with San Antonio in this game. I'm going to go and be the contrarian here, and I'm going to lay the points, and I'm not going to be suckered into the play and go ahead and grab the points with the Grizzlies. Hey, listen, as I've been saying the last few days, it's a grain of salt hunch play, but then again, I've won nine of my last 10 complimentary plays. I cashed in with another best bet last night with the Celtics. I'm kind of on a roll, so what the hell? Anyway, that's your complimentary play. Last San Antonio minus the points. I wish you well, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow when we do this one more time.